Thompson Medicine. Uh, his research focuses on machine learning, and particularly on optimal teaching, active learning, and semi-supervised semi learning. Uh, Jerry received his PhD from CMU in 2005. He's the recipient of, of, of an NFF, NSF Career Award, uh, several Best Paper Awards, a Classic Paper Prize, and he also served as co-chair of AI Stats in 2017. Please join me in welcoming Jerry Smith. So I'm going to talk about debugging as a way to provide interpretability. As I think, uh, it's going to provide a new opportunity for uh, interpretability. Now I'm going to start with a toy example, and uh, let's see. Uh, this is inspired by Harry Potter stories. For those of you who have read the book, we're creating a two-dimensional feature space where the x-axis is the magical heritage of a person, uh, a wizard, uh, Hogwarts school, where zero is uh, muggle born, or no magical born in a family with no magical properties, and one means a pure blood. Uh, it's an ambiguous feature. And the uh, y axis is their grade at Hogwarts, so zero means they essentially failed everything, and one is uh, very good. Okay? So if you know the characters, they belong to uh, those positions. Now, what we want to do is we want to create a synthetic data set where each point here is a student. Now what you will see is uh, they are labeled by a binary label where um, that means uh, after graduation are uh, they hired by the Ministry of Magic or not. So we will say that plus means yes they are hired and uh, surplus so means no they are not hired. Now if we look at this artificial data set, what we want to do is the following. We want to create a situation where there is a systematic bias in the data set itself. In particular, if you run a machine learning algorithm and train on this data set, you may get a decision boundary as a solid line here. Okay. Which, if you only look at the data, is actually sensible. Okay. In particular, the data is self-consistent and there is no <coughs> outlier-ish box, so you cannot see that. However, it's also plausible to say, um, well, we actually have a different desire. Maybe we want the actual ideal decision boundary to be the horizontal dashed line, meaning that whether somebody is hired or not is only related to their attribution level. Okay, so that's the data set. Now, we planted this systematic bias into the data set. The question is, can we see that? As I already hinted, just from the data set alone, you will not be able to see it. The data is quite self-consistent, and a model would be happy on that. So what we need is some additional information. Let's make the assumption that, in addition to this biased training data set, you may have additional data points, and that I will call trusted items. Now, these are items that may be a domain expert and spend a lot of money and effort to verify, okay, so they can be trusted. But they're very expensive, so uh, you cannot have too many of them. Okay. So these are denoted here by the two students uh, in red. And importantly, uh, one of them has this red plus symbol, so that is a student that we believe should be hired. So, if you have this additional trusted item, the first idea is, well, you have some new data, let's train on it. <coughs> but in reality, because the trusted item is scarce, if you just train on that, you will get very high variance result. So, as uh, denoted by the dashed line here, which is nowhere near our ideal decision boundary. Okay. So, you cannot use it like that. So let me uh, recap. Here's the situation. We have the, uh, what I would call, dirty uh, contaminated blue training items. We have a few trusted items. And the question is, well, what would you do? Here's what we propose. We want to say, let's do the following. Let's perturb or flip some of the labels in the blue training data set, such that 
if I retrain my model on its limited data set, my resulting model will correctly classify the uh, trusted items. And this is what our method will give you. It will identify the subset of training items that are very suspicious. That you know, if you flip them, you will get uh, a model which correctly uh, predict the trusted items. Okay, so that's what we want to do. Now let, let me generalize this idea further. Here is your standard machine learning training pipeline. We start from data, let's say it's a prediction class, so we have a feature X, label Y. Then we choose what learner to use, and I'm going to say that's determined by the loss function L. And the model, uh, the training algorithm also comes with hyperparameters lambda that you need to set. Once you do all those things, you train a model and you get this estimated model theta star. For illustration, I'm going to use the standard regularized empirical risk minimization framework where we I denote our mean of the search over the uh, parameter space theta, and then you minimize the loss function on the training data, then you also add a regularization term. So that's going to be our learning. Now, in addition to that, we need something called a post condition of your model. So I'm going to denote that by psi, and it's a Boolean function over the model that you get the data hat. Let's look at two examples. The first example is the trained model must correctly predict an important item, and that item X killed, Y killed, doesn't need to be in your training set. It actually could be your trusted item. That can be denoted by an theta hat viewed as a prediction function uh, applied to X killed gives you Y killed, the desired label. Or this could be, uh, in the case of fairness, uh, we can say maybe you want your learning model to satisfy individual fairness. And what that means is when two individuals, X and X prime, are similar in feature space, you want their label cost character to be also similar. Or in other words, this is a Lipschitz condition. Okay, we want these conditions to be defined as the post condition of your model. <laughs> we also want to assume what is a bug. We will say that post conditions would have been satisfied if you were to train through a clean machine learning pipeline. Okay. And then we're going to assume that the bugs are changes to that clean pipeline. Given that assumption, now we will assume that the post condition will be violated if the bug is present. With those assumptions, now it makes sense for us to say the debugging idea is to wiggle the training pipeline slightly and retrain the model until your resulting model satisfies the post condition. And whatever wiggle you did, we're going to propose that as potential bugs. Now, to formally describe this, I want to really drive home the message that we are not trying to just train a good model. Okay. So what I have here is the first line of mathematics is just the machine learning uh, model that we saw before, the machine learning algorithm. And you can say, OK, if I have this post condition on what the model needs to satisfy, I can easily add that just as a constraint to my optimization problem. Yes, you can do that, but you will get the following behavior. So what I have here in the gray circle is the parameter space of big theta. And I'm going to schematically say, whenever you do training, you have this training data x, y. And it's going to be a projection just going straight down until it hit uh, a point, the first point in your model space. Okay. What happens if you add this post condition as a constraint to model training is you essentially reduce the uh, parameter space, the hyper uh, hypothesis space, into this line, which is the line where your post condition is true. And when you train, you get this model theta hat that you know, goes through the gray area and hits the line. That's the model you get. 
I want to contrast this with what we actually are after, which is coming up on the next slide. This is what we want to do. We actually want to identify what the bugs are, and we even want to propose how to fix them. In doing so, as a byproduct, we want to learn the manner model. Okay, so the formulation is a little bit more complex. Let me explain. I'm actually going to use the special case where the bug is assumed to be in your training label only, nothing else. Okay. So in this case, remember why is the given training label and why is potentially there it contains potential uh, bugs. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to minimize over y prime. These are proposed or candidate labels that I will assign to my training set. And ignore that uh, theta hat on the uh, minimization that's just an uh, auxiliary variable. What I want to do here is I want to minimize the change that I have to do. So I want to minimize the difference between y and y prime. I want to propose as few changes to my uh, training label as possible. However, I want two things to be true. One thing is the final training model will be correct, uh, will satisfy the post condition. The second thing is I'm just using the standard machine learning training algorithm, but I'm giving it the modified labels. So that's the red, white, red in on the third line. Pictorially, if we start from the dirty XY training set, if you just train on that, you will hit the blue point on the uh, circle. What we need to do here is we need to wiggle where this Y prime is. We need to move to the left hand side. And uh, yeah, and uh, uh, to the right hand side. And uh, at that orange place, that's the first time when the learned model will satisfy the post condition. And that's the smallest change to my data. So that's going to be our intended solution. Uh, notice here, because you changed your labels into Y prime, whatever label you changed will be the proposed bug. And you also, by the way, know how to fix them because you know what Y prime is. OK, so. This is just what I said, but now uh, let's actually look at the, uh, the way to do it. So I'm going to assume that in this, you know, this particular special case, the bugs are only in the training labels, not anywhere else along the pipeline. Um, in particular, there is a clean label, I would just call it white right? And your training set is potentially contaminated, and that comes in the form of the Y prime label plus some noise. Okay, thinking of that big delta as the contamination to your label, it's flipping your labels. Okay. Now I want to emphasize that this bug mechanism does not assume uh, the delta to be just outlier type of bugs. They're not necessarily very large magnitude um, changes. And they can be systematic throughout your data space. Okay, so to be concrete, here are the things you give to the debugger. The dirty training set, X, Y. Those are the blue points. The trusted items, the red points, um, I'm going to call it X killed and Y killed, and this is a much smaller set. And third, you also need to give the debugger your learning algorithm. As an output, the debugger will give you back Y prime, the proposed, uh, new labels, and also its confidence on those changes. We have seen this optimization problem before. Uh, this is just the instance where uh, I explicitly write out the loss function with the proposed Y prime new label in it. Okay. Now, if you look at this optimization problem, it turns out it's pretty difficult for two reasons. One is here we're optimizing over Y prime the labels. And the labels are discrete objects, so we have a combinatorial problem here. Number two, I have a minimization problem, but if you look at the third line, the constraint itself is another optimization problem. In fact, that third line is machine learning. 
So this problem is known as a bi-level optimization problem. And the formulation is equivalent to machine teaching. We will have a workshop on Saturday on machine teaching, teaching uh, machines, robots, and humans, where such problems will be discussed in program. Now, how do you solve this? We solve this problem by doing several steps of relaxation. The first step is to relax a discrete label into a soft probability distribution. So in other words, instead of a discrete label, I'm going to replace those variables, y primes, with deltas. And these are going to be probability distributions over labels. So that they live in the probability simplex. And second, I'm going to replace the counting of how many labels I have to change with just the change in probability mass. So if you look at this, this expression, I'm really talking about uh, 1 minus delta i y i, that is the probability mass I give or I move away from the dirty label. So we want that to be as small as possible. And third, I'm going to soften this post condition that my trend model must predict the trusted items correct. Instead of saying I predict things correctly, I'm just going to say the trusted item has a small loss. With these three steps, now I removed all the discrete quantities in my optimization problem. And that gave me something like this. You don't have to parse the, um, the optimization problem. However, it's still obvious that I have the machine learning problem downstairs, so I still have a bi-level optimization problem. So the next set of steps is to remove that. In particular, I'm going to remove the machine learning problem by using the KKT condition, assuming my machine learning <coughs> objective is convex. So I can rewrite the uh, machine learning problem equivalently as the KKT condition. That allows me to define an implicit function that's denoted in red, where I say my learned parameter theta now is a function of delta. Okay, but that's an implicit function defined via the QED condition. Then I will be able to use implicit function theorem in order to compute the gradient, and from which I can use gradient method to solve the overall problem. So at the very end of the day, I have a continuous but nonlinear problem that I can solve. And software with this is for this. So this is just to show you what you already saw data set uh, and uh, our debugger. The, uh, the data set and uh, the box or potential box that's flagged by our method. Okay. As you can see here in the middle plot, um, it flagged all the reasonable actual box. And you can contrast this with several baselines, which will, I will not go into details, but Basically, our method uh, identifies the most interesting set of potential bugs. So, so far, I have assumed that what's wrong in your machine learning pipeline is the training label. Now, I'm going to give you another special example where what's wrong is your choice of hyperparameters. So, what I'm showing here again is a data set where the x-axis is students' test scores. And the y-axis is the binary label, whether the student passed or failed the exam. Okay. Now, the data set really is very clear because we have the 60 point as the threshold. It's a hard threshold. It's a rule, actually, to define whether uh, somebody passed or failed. Now, if you train a logistic regression classifier on this data set, you may end up with the red curve. 
So what happens here is, because the data set is actually linear and separable, we have a target threshold at 60. Um, logistic regression really would like to create a very steep step function here in order to maximize the conditional likelihood. Okay? So that is all fine by itself. However, let's assume that you have a post condition. You're saying that I want this classifier to satisfy individual fairness. As we stated earlier, that is a Lipschitz condition on the behavior of your curve. In particular, um, we assume that your post condition is your posterior distribution, PY equals 1 given x, must be L Lipschitz, okay, where L is the Lipschitz constant. So, Conceptually, that means you really want your curve to be smooth and it doesn't jump up too steeply. Now, as I said, we're going to assume that in this case, the bugs are in the pipeline in the form of your uh, regularization parameter lambda. So lambda controls uh, how much you regularize the norm of the theta. With that, we will formulate essentially the same kind of optimization problem where you allow the system to search for a different lambda, in this case, lambda prime. The objective says you want to um, minimize the change to that regularization parameter. Subject to two conditions. One is the resulting model has to be smooth enough and that model is trained by logistic regression now using your new lambda prime regularization parameter. If you solve this problem, you will get this solution where the optimum lambda prime is a much larger number than uh, the actual lambda we started with. And the model itself, the theta, the logistic regression model, now becomes this green curve. So this is another case where uh, this would give you a suggestion of what hyperparameters, uh, how it needs to be changed, and in what direction, and by how much. Okay, I would also like to take this opportunity and uh, call for our community to create a machine learning bug repository. One difficulty in this line of research when we start to talk about debugging machine learning is there really isn't many good uh, data sets that contains known machine learning bugs. Okay. Unlike the software engineering community where people create software bug repository and they use that to test debugging methods. Um, I, I, I hope we will create data sets like that where you keep data prominence where we say, hey, here's my original bad data set, but you know, this data point should really be that, and so on and so forth. So this is going to be essentially the UCI for machine learning debug. With that, I conclude, and here are the references to uh, the papers we have that covers this topic, and thank you very much. Hi, uh, it's a dream for IBM research. Thank you so much for interesting work. The question is, okay, uh, up front, right, how would you know what type of bug do you have? Because your formulation really depends on that assumption up front. Indeed. So um, what I showed here is really proof of concept. And one would imagine that for real, one strategy is to assume you have bugs everywhere in the pipeline. Uh, but if you control for the total cost of debugging, then the framework could give you, could essentially prioritize those suggestions and give you the most suspicious part in the pipeline. Uh, could you use this to uh, uh, correct the data set based on the test set? So 
um, can you repeat the question? Okay, you do have the training set. Okay, you know on the set set the errors you make. So you could do the exact same procedure to find what are the suspicious examples in your training set. And if you do this several times with different uh, assay splits, you you could have something like your confidence of any uh, example in your training set. I imagine that's correct. You can certainly um, use the same framework to um, essentially flag suspicious test items. Now, um, in, in some ways, there is really no difference in training versus test item because you could also say it's just a big bunch and I'm going to split that. That's completely fine. I've noticed our requirement here uh, in, in the first case of uh, some additional trusted items. So they sound a lot like additional test items, actually. But it's just like you trust them more because you spend a lot of time looking at them and so on. So this work seems to be like a one way of defending against the trading data poisoning attacks. And I'm not sure have you ever tried to like detect those, you know, uh, carefully made attacks because they, those are not like the natural bias. They are man-made and then like hard to play. Optimized for your yes, customer. that's a very good question. In fact, if we come to the workshop uh, on Saturday, we're going to talk extensively about uh, applications of motion teaching to uh, data poisoning attacks. Now, uh, it is true that you can use this very framework to detect training set poisoning. Uh, there's no uh, free lunch, right? The, the price that you have to pay is uh, you have to have some good trusted items. Thank you very much.